Welcome to the Proteomics in Proximity podcast, where your co-hosts Dale Yuzuki, Cindy Lawley and Sarantis Klamidis from Olink Proteomics talk about the intersection of proteomics with genomics for drug target discovery, the application of proteomics to reveal disease biomarkers, and current trends in using proteomics to unlock biological mechanisms. Here we have your hosts, Dale, Cindy and Sarantis. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm happy to welcome you in another episode from Proteomics in Proximity, together with uh, my co-hosts, Dale and Cindy. We are really happy today to have with us Ida Grundberg, the Chief Scientific Officer of Olink, and we're really happy to discuss with her about her career and uh, ongoing projects and ongoing outcomes in, uh, in Olink. Welcome, Ida. Thank you very much. Thanks for having Great. me. Great to Great be here. Great you can join us. <laughs> Thank, thank you very much, Rita, for joining. Actually, I will start the question by, and I, I would like to know a little bit more about your, your background and uh, what was your, your studies and how would you see your transition from academic to, to the industry? Can you share a little bit more of your experience? It would be really nice to hear. <laughs> of course. I don't know how much time we have, but I try to, to keep, it, keep it short. Um, so I'm a molecular biologist by training. And then I joined um, Professor Ulf Landegren's group to start my PhD. And at the time I joined, he had actually just founded Olling. So they were just the floor be, be, be above us. So I was very early introduced to, to Olling. But uh, it was a great group to, to spend a PhD in, uh, very inspiring and creative. We were developing all different molecular tools, targeting DNA, RNA, and, and protein, depending on the research question. So I think that, thanks to my time there, I got a, a great foundation uh, and a very open, open mind to, to the importance of all the, all, all the omics. And Ida, I'm curious, what years roughly, yeah. I mean, not to date yourself, <laughs> but what okay. years were, was it the early 2000s, late 1990s? It was the 1800s, no. Yeah. <laughs> so <that> was, <laughs> I, I, I joined Ulf's uh, lab in January 2006, and they had founded in okay. late 2004, but the first employee came on board, I think, in 2006. But the first employee came on board, I think, in 2006. And so I was there between 2006 and 11. Uh, and then I focus actually more, sorry to say, not on proteins, but on the transcriptomic side. So I was working more with uh, Professor Matt Nielsen's group, developing a technology for transcript detection, more for point mutation and, and genotyping applications for, for colorectal cancer and, and lung cancer applications. So it was actually... Due was this... Yeah. Uh I'm sorry, was this using sequencing? No, so that was an in situ based uh, application. Mm -hmm. So we were using padlock probes ah, that also had been invented in, in Ulf and, and Matt's uh, group. So there was a yes. microscope uh, readout. So really like pad padlock probes. Yes. Similar to molecular inversion, yes, exactly. Halo genomics. Exactly, they were all Got in it. the family. So again, it was we yep. were almost 50, 50 people at the time. So again, wow. a fantastic group to be in. Very privileged to 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 have done my PhD there. So it was during my last year where actually the technology I have been working on developing that we licensed that together with Olink. So that was my door into into the company. So just after I finished my PhD, I continued at R&D at Olink and first uh, focused on continue commercializing that technology that was later um, sold off to, to another company. And I continued at R&D working more on the technologies that, that, we, uh, that we are focusing on now, more on the proximity extension assay. And that was also around the time when, when we first launched the first panel. So that a lot of things were um, were happening and still keep in mind that that was the early days. So I don't know, maybe we were 25 people, more than half of the company were at R&D. Um, but then of course we had a commercialization uh, going. So then I was recruited to the small commercial team at, at the time. Um, and I mean, first uh, I had been in academia, so for me it was like, wow, a transition. Should I go into sales? 
But at that time, I mean, we had zero customers, uh, one product coming out. So it was really, a, a, from the beginning, a very scientific cell working with our collaborators, uh, close um, friends uh, in Uppsala. Um, so I think we were three people at the commercial team at the time. Um, so I didn't see it as a <laughs> as a scary transition, actually. But I always and been help me with yeah. the date. Help me with the dates. Now <laughs> is this two thousand fifteen? No, no, no. Or? So now we're thirteen. Uh, so so oh, still okay. very early early days. Um, so the first now we call it Target Night the Six Oncology was launched in 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 twenty thirteen. Um, so then I spent some years uh, covering the, the Nordic and European, and then at uh, 2015, we had decided that the biggest market is in the US. We need to have someone uh, being based there. So I was asked if I could go over and, and start off our US market. Um, so that's when I did the move to, to Boston. Well, uh, that must have been such an interesting transition for you exactly. to... To, yeah. to start something in the U.S. where, you know, no, no recognition of the technology, right. no friends, no colleagues, <laughs> maybe, maybe a few colleagues. Yeah. How was that? And, and yeah, how was that? No, no, you're, you're, you're right. It was, uh, it was extremely exciting, but also extremely scary, uh, mm. but <laughs> a very valuable experience. Uh, but as you said, I, 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 I had zero colleagues. In, in the US, I moved to Boston by myself. I had been Whoa. there once before for like a day. <laughs> so I knew basically no one. Um, and since we didn't have anything on, on place really, we had to start from, from scratch, but took day by day and, and first settling in at an incubator in, in Cambridge and starting connecting with the amazing few customers we had at the time and went from there. <laughs> What what was one of the most influential customers at that time? Is it is there someone you can point to, or a couple of them that really opened your eyes to to how the technology could change things? Yeah, no, but for sure. I mean, we were very lucky to, for example, working with the Broad from really the beginning. So the incubator uh, that I was working from was basically in the same block as as the Broad. So definitely there I spent some time and trying to get in and set up some seminars and so on. So um, we had some there and also at the MGH, we had some early, early adopters there as well. So I tried to stick very close to close to them. Um, So that was really the beginning and also why why we decided to to set up in in Boston, Cambridge. I mean, that, that is the mecca of life Smart. science, but also where we have not a, the, the early adopters. Yeah. Not a bad neighborhood to hang out in. <laughs> yeah. You know, right next door to the road, yeah. just down the street from MGH. Right, exactly. I remember like walking down Broadway and I felt my IQ was just racing. So <laughs> that was a good, good spot. <laughs> Would you remember any of the first projects you that you have been involved one one so your favorite let's say the first favorite one you, you mean uh, from from the us market from the, yes from the us from the us market one of the first that you yeah, it's really no, close to your heart for actually sh- for sure i mean since we basically no one knew about us we we had to have some some strategies on how are we going to actually generate some some evidence and content because already back then we believed in i mean it's not enough just us showing what the power the power of the technology, but generating real data. So we hooked up with some some um, some researchers at at Stanford and in San Diego. So with Stanford, uh, we had more of a wellness study where we were comparing different diets that uh, that the different uh, group of peoples were on. So we could track the the effect of inflammation if you're on a high high fat or low carb diet so that was one of these mm-hmm. case studies that we early did another one was done in san diego with professor doug galasco where he had a, a study on the effect of antioxidants on on um, alzheimer disease so there we also did a study together with him so we could generate uh, great data that we could go out and, and have joint uh, road shows with uh, I mean, from your work in the in situ transcriptomics, mm. 
now to Alzheimer's and wellness, yeah. right? What a shift, <laughs> a huge yeah. shift, right? And what early days to be looking at wellness, right? This right. is such it's a so hot topic sure. now, right? Isn't, yeah. that, whole- isn't that amazing? Yeah, exactly. I don't know if it was just luck, but those early studies have still been, I mean, shown to be very modern yeah. and been, I mean, very, um, I mean, active in the space as, as well now. So uh, luck maybe, yeah, and Doug, but... <laughs> and Doug's still leading the way at yeah. AAIC or the Alzheimer's uh, yeah. uh, arena for sure. It's yeah, exactly. so remarkable. But we have also, I think all of you have heard about that, but it could be a nice story as well. So again, since, I mean, coming to the U.S. and basically no one knew about Olink and these little small Swedish company um, but I mean for being such a small country there is a lot of great researchers and scientists in the state so we try to also work very closely with them we formed what we called the Swedish Mafia uh, so we could all like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <about four. laughs> we didn't say it we didn't say it we didn't say it not, I, not it. the Swedish we're not ashamed of that you know? uh, yes no, true. No, 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 that's great <laughs> To be clear, this is not the Swedish house mafia. That's a music thing. They were supporting but us the well. Swedish they mafia. were supporting us well. <laughs> <laughs> no, From but seriously, time. so it was great. So we, we have that at Stanford and in, uh, Rockefeller and, and teamed up with them. And then they were also happy to, to support and really put Sweden on the map there. So uh, And we have, for sure, a, a good reputation in, in especially in, in protein history. So we try to also leverage on that and not just saying with this unknown Swedish company, but we're proud and it's, we're here for a reason because we know this. And as far as then the early days, people were sending samples, mm. right? You were getting customers sending samples to Uppsala, but then shortly after, right? Didn't you start actually building a laboratory yeah. here? No, what exactly. Like? So I moved in 2015 then. Yes, I mean, a few months after we started to, to have these studies coming in and some of them were uh, critical to have them run in the, in the States. So then we, of course, we wanted an office in Boston, but we realized we also need a lab. Um, so that's when we started to, to look for different places. Um, so my role was very broad, going around looking at different spaces. Uh, and then we found this beautiful old garage in Watertown. <laughs> yes, Literally. Yes, yes, a garage. Yes, yes. Wow. Yeah, a garage. I'll show you a picture. They, um, yeah, no, but it was, it was going to be rebuilt into, into a, a, a small lab space. Um, and so that's, that's where we started and the rest is history. And we always thought this garage story was was great and used to say that, well, Apple started in the garage too. So, uh, <laughs> That's wow. <laughs> and this particular garage, then you installed a biomark, mm-hmm. right? And I understand an employee, uh, Dan Frederick mm-hmm. of ours, who's an application scientist, he told me a little bit about that first installation. Yeah. What can you tell me about it? I don't know any details. That, I mean, it was... <laughs> it was two or We, we started one? with one. He said... Uh, we did, but okay. the space was so tight. So, I mean... <laughs> It, it was funny. We, I mean, we grew out of that small garage in no time. Um, and especially when we were going to like have two biomarks. And I can't remember. I think we even had three there. And, you know, wow. these are big, big They're pieces. Big. Very so big. In yeah. the end, we were having meetings in the cars outside because <laughs> we, oh. we couldn't fit in there. <laughs> The car. Wow. wow. Yeah. Meet me in my car. Yeah. And, and from that to we're doing a podcast, right? Yeah. I mean, that's just <laughs> such that's an so interesting. Huge. Yeah. Yeah. Dan told the story of how it grew so mm. quickly. And then, of course, when the opportunity came for him to work for Olink, it was a very easy decision for him to make, seeing that just witnessing firsthand yeah. that kind of growth. Yeah. Um, and these customers then, I mean, you had to hire, or I guess you then hired people to run the mm. run the laboratory assays, that mm-hmm. kind of thing. You were central to yeah, that. No, no, yeah, no, for sure. I mean, so one of the first employees was Jen, who is still working with us. She's great. So she's been there with the, from the beginning and, and many others as well. So 
So we many times we get nostalgic and, and remembers the garage, <laughs> the, the good old days, tight quarters. Yeah, and I think also together with all inclusion growth, the the need of people to use proteomics, right? You mm-hmm. see this change of people of thinking and from one publication to thousand publications, right? Mm-hmm. How how do you see this? How do you live this? Actually, how was your feeling for the first publication when it came out? Can you describe it a bit? The, oh, the, I mean, the, that, that was that was huge. We used to have like a bell, so we're walking in the corridors like, wow, <laughs> this, this, like, <laughs> it was big, that. it was big. Um, and especially, I mean, looking back, the first paper that was in Nature Communication, our close uh, collaborator, Professor Ulf Gillenstein, um, it was a great paper. I mean, looking back, it was uh, only Amazing. one one panel of 92 proteins, but a big study. Uh, so fascinating outcome that really paved the way for to where we are today. So, uh, it, yeah. For those who mm. may not be familiar, right? This paper did a thousand over a thousand Swedish individuals. Yeah. So they had genotyping data, right. and then they looked at ninety-two proteins yeah. and did GWAS to protein. Mm. Then they had health outcome data, and then they had all the clinical mm. data, so they can talk about the influence, right, of genetics upon right. the biomarkers, genetics upon the outcomes, and then the other lifestyle and clinical yeah. factors. Yeah. I mean, reading reading it now, I mean, it was a 2014 mm. paper, and it was like, wow, yeah, yeah. exactly, yeah. What and it even was, proteins it the, page? The fascinating cohort of it. So it's a population study from the very far north of Sweden, Karesuando, uh, where it's like freezing year round, <laughs> uh, and they had been following <laughs> this thousand individuals for for a long time and as you said had all the information on their lifestyle and and diets but they wanted to add proteomics to it and then I mean still less than 100 proteins but they could gain so much data and insights from this uh, from this results and I mean they're just Quickly, their conclusion or the take home from from the study was that they could really see the effect of non disease factors. So, this was a healthy population, mm-hmm. but still, still see that I think more than 50% of the proteins were varying, um, of the variants were actually coming from these genetic and lifestyle factors. So, like age and blood pressure and weight and smoking habits, all of that had an enormous effect uh, on proteins. Um, and they mapped all of that. So. It's just demonstrating that, that value of capturing real time biology mm. in the context of the genetics. It's, yeah. a, it's a phenomenal paper. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And also, it was a very broad paper that they could also follow up. They, they called it like a publication generator, the, the data that they get out, because then they could also follow yeah. up and see, so what should we do with all this information? Is there any way that we can associate these results to more, I mean, actionable, diagnostical, clinical uh, biomarkers? So they, in the follow-up paper, they proposed a, a model to adjust for these um, variables. Uh, and that is, I mean, that algorithm that they proposed back then is, is very relevant uh, today that, I mean, find really select the most robust biomarkers that are not uh, varying uh, because of these non-disease factors. So a great start of the, the thousand papers. It sort of reminds me a little bit of, um, and sorry to make the parallel to the to the sequencing space, but that's sort of sequence once query often, right? You have such a broad look at proteins mm. that you can deep dive into those data for multiple different purposes across that population. Just at that time, I mean, that was very high plex. I mean, mm. we call that mid plex now, you know, but, but that's, that's, that's a, a beautiful uh, point about the data set. Mm. And what was also really interesting for me was this idea of clinical yep, cutoff. Exactly, personal. In that you have sort of individuals, right, with certain levels of certain mm. biomarkers. And if you have a certain one or a handful that spike up or yeah. drop off, that means something's mm. happening, right, health wise for that individual. Mm. So here we're talking about personalized medicine based upon the individual's protein profile at a given time 
and their genetic background, and of course their lifestyle and the different things that they do. I mean, I, I was thinking this is personalized medicine. This is yeah, the future, and it's, right? <clears throat> it's in reference to the you know the population that that you're able to compare it to, and. Today we're seeing such diverse populations being characterized with proteomics, so it's mm. a it's an exciting time there as well, right? But we we started somewhere, and that that ability to be personalized and translate the the impact genetics is having on mm. something that we might actually take to the clinic, mm. maybe not maybe not O Link, but but those customers is is yeah exciting. Mm. This particular population in the far north of Sweden is still being followed then today? I, I don't think they have um, uh, additional samples taken as far as I, as far, mm. as far as I know, but they continued studying that. Mm. And then also, I mean, since that was the first more epidemiology study we did, they also were part of a European, I think, yeah. European network with other concerned populations that followed. Um, so that was really the start uh, of it. And also with all this lifestyle factor, mm. they had many more papers coming where they were looking into <laughs> the specific uh, specific factors affecting, like the Swedish tobacco with the with the uh, snuff, for example, that they saw associations to some ah. biomarkers, and they got some media attention for also using that to to look at aging and biological versus chronological aging and how diets like fish and coffee can affect or reduce your your aging and so on so it, it was it was fascinating um that's that great came news out. yeah great news for us coffee drinkers for sure <laughs> yeah yeah exactly yeah well i think on on the reference to snuff for those not familiar with it it's really popular in sweden i guess most of europe yeah. But I think it hasn't hit the U.S. yet. Is it popular in Greece, Sarantis? No, I haven't. This is this. No, I haven't. Yes. It's kind of a thing you put in your gum, and it's is it nicotine? Yes, Ida? for sure. Is that what no, it's, it's very popular. It's, not, it's, not, it's, sure. it's, not it's popular very... in Greece for sure. No, it's not no, it's actually Greece, just. Sure. I mean, not even all of Nordic, but some of the Nordic countries. But yes, that's why also this type of research <laughs> was supported. But I, I would say it's very popular in some areas of the U.S. as well, for sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so you've you've seen it, Sydney. Yeah, here, all right. Absolutely, I've but dated the beauty a few. of this cohort is like Guys. it was really well conserved and isolated cohort, right? Then they can see the real effects and the real association with the biomarkers without any so much external air pollution or other factors mm. that may influence with that, right? That, that right. was the beauty of this. Actually, that was the beauty. Yeah, amazing. Yes, yes, exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, it's hard to capture those environmental variables, right? But that the that the protein levels could exceed the challenges with capturing some environmental variables that's a mm. i think that's a message that i find we have to convey to a lot of geneticists who are used to the signals being weaker and harder to see uh you know and having the power to detect some of these polygenic signals uh to disease can be more challenging in in genetic studies that are solely you know, genetics and disease, but I think bringing in proteins can allow for, for a magnification of that ability to see that association. Mm. Yeah, so then back to that, this was the first publication. I don't think we could have asked for a better better, better start. Agreed. As it really first, I mean, demonstrated the robustness of the technology. That was very important, being new into the market, but also the power of, of as Cindy said, combining high quality proteomics with genetics and this epidemiological information. And now a thousand publications <laughs> later, I understand the same group had a very interesting recent Olink publication mm. as well. Uh, what can you share about that? Yeah, I mean, the, they have since the beginning. So they started more with population uh, health studies and then uh, part of the one of the cores they did, they, they saw some interesting signatures for gynecological cancer. So then they continued uh, drilling down that path uh, and then saw early an interesting signature for, um, for patient stratification of ovarian cancer. So we worked with them uh, around that. And it was actually based with uh, or together with this group that we also uh, begin our journey with our focus panel with custom development so we 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 helped out with developing that protocol with the input from FDA and and that whole uh, story and now I love 
Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. I was just going to say, I also love that Stefan Enroth, who was the first author mm-hmm. on that early paper, is now the uh, the PI, the last yes, author time has in passed. this most recent paper. Like, he, yeah. you know, <laughs> exactly. we all evolve. Yeah. Yeah. No, exactly. So they have continued. I mean, we developed a, a focus signature uh, panel for ovarian cancer where they could see that they were superior to what is actually used today in diagnostic for diagnostics uh, in the US, uh, but they have continued trying to polish on that and, and hoping to get it to, to something clinically uh, useful uh, and also looked into other matrices. So this was first based on, on, on plasma, but also looking into alternative matrices that can be uh, sampled in a home environment with, with filter papers and now using our Explore, the broadest um, library. Um, so that was a paper that came out just, was it last week or two weeks ago, where they now have uh, continued to, to really um, polished on, on this signature. Mm-hmm. So great work. And, and for background, right, ovarian cancer, third major uh, fatality rate, you know, not very good bar- biomarkers at all. CA125 has been used for ages mm. and it's just not that great. Um, you, know, you mentioned patient stratification, so uh, this particular focus and what you're talking about is a custom mm. product, right, of 15 to 21 markers. Um, they applied a handful of markers. Was that to stratify patients for treatment? So it, the, the first, I mean, their first question was more for patient stratification because there's... Uh, Many women are are having surgery without needing it, basically. So that was the first where they wanted to to stratify um, women with benign cysts from ovarian cancer, um, like a blood test Mm -hmm. to stratify those. So that's where they started. But now going into more diagnostic applications for, for, yeah, basically early diagnostic of the to to identify those early stages. Yes. So is this also for recurrence monitoring? Yes. Or mainly, yes. yes. So that's a huge yes. application, right? Where women will have mm. right uh, cysts removed, like mm. you mentioned, but they don't know when, right? They need to go ahead and and you know, there's really no real good way to measure when it's mm. coming back, and so it's it's like living underneath this constant yeah. fear, right, of recurring uh, ovarian cancer, which. Yeah, it's this huge medical yeah, burden. Yeah, for sure. And especially if we can come to the point where we could have for more careful monitoring of those in, in high in high risk. Um, yeah. yeah, I love that it's yeah. in women's health as well, right? Mm-hmm. Which we, we talk about being an area that, that could use some more funding, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, um, you, you mentioned then about Explore and, and perhaps alternative matrices, that kind of mm. thing, right? I mean, that has must been uh, from that start with the early work with 92-plex uh, you know, uh, assays now to 3,000. I mean, over that time, I'm, I'm curious, you mentioned alternative matrices. What, what were some of the more unusual <laughs> things you've seen? Yeah. In terms of in all these years, ways people are measuring proteins. Yeah, I, I, I mean, we. I think we have we have covered the whole human body really. <laughs> um, so <laughs> never stop being surprised with like, and why do you want to run ground teeth? Okay, so that's one example that was like wow. surprising wow. to hear. But teeth, teeth. yes, exactly. Uh, teeth. But of course, tears, saliva, urines, those are quite common. CSF, of course, but then. Um, different types of, of biopsies, also extremely important, of course, fine needle biopsies, um, interstitial flu- fluids, synovi- synovial fluids, um, blister fluids from uh, burn uh, victims. Um, wow. wow, interesting. Yeah, no, I mean, we, we, we have covered, I think, everything. Intestinal juice was interesting when we got... <laughs> There was some, some <laughs> device that collected intestinal juice, so so we we ran it and it worked. So how interesting! So I think a lot of these samples, right, where you don't even bother to quantitate how much proteins in the sample because you consume a lot of it, right? <laughs> and people don't know beforehand if it'll work. However, 
right? We have assurance that we use very small volumes. We were mm. able to be very sensitive to pick up very low sort of amounts of protein available, yeah. uh, right? Pe- people just say, well, we don't know, therefore we just need to go ahead and yeah. try it. And many times yes. it works. Yeah. Ex- Is that exactly. Right? I mean, we have had applications where they said, we collected these very precious samples years ago, but we couldn't use it for anything. And now we have the opportunity and we could deliver extremely valuable data. So all of these fine needle biopsies or microvesicles, tape strips, just collecting a few cells. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So it I has mean, a these, huge uh, impact. Yeah, these antibody mm. hooks, right? Mm. They're hooking it out of these this solution in such a low volume. It's yeah. really pretty exciting, yeah. And then we haven't talked and about the different as, uh-huh. species that we have uh, done yes. as well. Oh, so yes. That's a whole zoo, a zoo at the, <laughs> the Dolink that we have done as well. So tell us. <laughs> what are the most <laughs> interesting? So, so you know, uh, just to be clear, our 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 protein targets are are optimized or developed in R and D uh, to human uh, with all but our mouse mouse panel, right? Mm-hmm. We certainly have a mouse panel, and so when someone comes in and wants to understand what's going on with a cow, for example, mm-hmm. what do you what do you tell them, and and what are the most extreme examples that you've seen? Yeah, I mean, what we tell them, of course, exactly what what you said, that we don't have any cow-specific panels, but, Mm. I mean, it's quite close homology in many for many of these species to to humans, and they don't have any other better options. Uh, So we we give them more data than they could get from anywhere anywhere else. So, I mean, of course, rodents, um, non-human primates, Dogs, mm. cows, uh, fish, horse. Wow. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, Many interesting. Great. And so actually they're able to measure proteins out of fish, <laughs> even though you, we know that, right, our antibodies are generated against antigens from human, but still we're able to actually I, you know, conclusively identify that. Yeah, the proteins measured in a fish sample I, 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 were I think actually the, the proteins. The detectability in fish was was low, uh, so yes, <laughs> it's not <laughs> anything we recommend <laughs> normally. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I but, see. I mean, with some underlying information that you can get from for specific proteins, you can get yeah. some in, interesting results out of it. But. Yeah. It reminds yeah. me again, bringing back into the genetics is you know we worked on a whale project. And there are no SNP chips for whales, right? So we used human, I think we used the same uh, HapMap 300 that was used in this uh, Enroth paper, Enroth et al. paper in 2014, to uh, to see how many SNPs we could find homology uh, across species. And it was actually pretty pretty useful. Mm. So, um, yeah, interesting. Mm. It's coming back uh, a little bit to populational and uh, generation of big data. I mean, I know now that there are some, uh, let's say, projects running in holding in, in regards of uh, visualizing, uh, integrating data, and only inside. Would you give us a little bit of uh, of feedback on that? Could you give us some comments on that, just uh, to get to know a little more details? Do you refer to the the big population? Only inside. To the to the only inside. Only inside. Actually. inside. inside. Yes. Of course. Of course. So yes, All Link Insight is a very, very exciting new initiative that, that we have. So it's a digital knowledge platform for proteomics that we have built for our customers and, and community. And, and there is when looking at, I mean, in the digital space, there's nothing of this kind on the market today. So we how we started that we thought that since we we see us as the leaders in proteomic assays, so we also want to be pioneers in the digital space and, and drive the development for more modern, innovative tools um, to help. I mean, proteome, the proteome is very complex. The data analysis can be extremely challenging. If we can, with our insights and experience, try to support the community to faster come to conclusions and actionable uh, results, by developing tools and, and connect different uh, public databases and different annotations tool, we can help to support them throughout basically the, the journey. 
So it's I'm, I'm very very excited about uh, about all link insights. So the different we're gonna have or we have different apps to support the the analytics side as well as as open data sets that they can use for validation or confirmation of a disease signature or compare with a healthy proteome uh, and also share data stories where it's like best practice uh, analytics uh, for different applications so it's it's a what fantastic the, platform yeah one of the best features within that that I've struggled with since I joined Olink is that conversion from gene name where you have you know many different gene names for a, a single gene uh, converting that to the protein that is coded for mm -hmm. by that gene, right? So because in the genetic space, so many people work with genes. So there can be, you know, a dash in there or no dash in there, or there can be something that looks like a date. So you throw that into Excel and it's a real pain to look up DEC1, right? But to be able to pull that out of insights, it's such a simple thing, but, you know, mm -hmm. it's a, it's, it's got a nice functionality. Uh, that I think is just a, a microcosm of the bringing together of the genetics and the proteomics, just a nice example of, of how thought out it was in the needs. And for those interested in trying it out, it's free to use. Mm -hmm. It's at insight.olink.com. Um, one of the another interesting features that relates to the thousand publications is the ability to search publications by biomarker. Is that correct, mm -hmm. Ida? Correct. So this is a uh, basically a, why wouldn't I use PubMed versus th this particular feature within Insight? No, exactly. And I think that's one of the features at Insight that you can go to, to PubMed. But of course, if you want to see the thousand publications in different categories, that's a, a, the, 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 the place to go, but also in general, it has very smart, smart search tools. Um, but it's public yeah, information, yeah. but we have tried to, to make it in an even uh, more user-friendly interface. The same as with the, uh, the Pathway Explorer that, that we call it, that is based on the amazing Reactome database. But it also has some yeah. additional layers to it where you can in, in, insert a list of your top markers and really see the underlying um, biological pathways and mechanisms. So it, it's a fantastic tool. Go there. And you can, I was, you can download the images as well, right? Once you've yes. got that and publication savvy. I mean, I was, when I was playing with it, I was shocked when I clicked on a single node and the amount of information that I can find about that node in really well-written prose with references and you know everything I wanted to know almost in like three or four paragraphs. Uh, it was remarkable work. Um, a lot of work obviously has gone yeah. into it and remarkable mm. resource. So, well, thank you, Ida, for joining us today. I mean, really great. enjoyed this conversation. Yes. Is there any last words you'd like to share with our audience? <laughs> no, I think this is just the beginning. I think still a thousand is an amazing milestone, but I think already this year it's been 250. So maybe I can be invited again when we reach 2000 or something, and it's going to be <laughs> there you go. January or something. <laughs> you are always welcome. Yeah. Always yeah. welcome. Yeah. Oh, and that's then, great. as always, that's I mean, a big shout out to all of our, both the early adopters that's been been with us since the beginning and, and supported us. Uh, we wouldn't be anywhere without them. So those are the most important players here. Absolutely. For sure. All right. Till next time. Thank you <laughs> thank again you. for great. joining thanks, us. Thanks, thank you. Yeah. That's great. Bye-bye. All Bye. right. Thank you for listening to the Proteomics in Proximity podcast, brought to you by Olink Proteomics. To contact the hosts or for further information, simply email info at olink.com. <laughs> <laughs>